Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to everyone. Hope you guys are doing well today. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu alaykum wa ala wa sahbihi wa nuha. So uh, we do this every week now, alhamdulillah, where we have um, a live Q&A. Uh, it's every week at, um, at 11 a.m. Central Time, 12 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, where we give you guys a chance to ask questions about some of our recent publications. Uh, so last week we had, uh, or two weeks ago rather, we had Dr. Jonathan Brown, um, who was talking about his Hudud uh, paper today, inshallah ta'ala, I'll be talking about the uh, publication, How the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Rose Above Enmity and Insult. So this was uh, a paper in which, um, you know, it was co-authored by Sheikh Muhammad al-Shanawi and myself. Um, and basically we compiled uh, 70 moments where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi rose above enmity and insult. And, um, you know, this was the first time it's been done in any language. So alhamdulillah, it's, uh, I hope it's a contribution that can be referred to for imams, for khatibs, for people that uh, have to speak on this issue, scholars um, or students of knowledge. Um, and uh, the, the post on Huffington, or the, what we put in, the entry we put on Huffington Post actually was shared over 10,000 times, alhamdulillah. So it had quite some traction uh, with Muslims and non-Muslims. Uh, and the goal was, of course, to show that, uh, you know, Islamophobes can misconstrue two or three incidents about the Prophet them. Sometimes the authenticity is doubtful, and then, or sometimes they're clearly taking things out of context. Uh, but, you know, how can you argue with such a body of uh, incidents where the Prophet ﷺ clearly demonstrated a consistent trait of grace uh, in the face of enmity and insult, which would therefore reduce everything else. Everything else would be studied as the exception. So, uh, inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to go ahead and open it up uh, for questions. Um, you guys can feel free to send them my way. So you guys are free to ask questions, inshallah. I see we got uh, 29 viewers. Um, feel free to throw anything my way, inshallah. All right, so the first question is that um, when we talk about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as, well, let me read this question. When we talk about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as someone who rose above enmity and insult, um, what do we do about those exceptions? Um, and how do we study those exceptions? So particularly this question mentions uh, Ka'b ibn Ashraf. Um, actually, that's sort of the point of the research was that you start off from from this premise or based on this premise that this is who the Messenger وسلم, always was. Then you can move on to the incidents and the exceptions. When you look at, uh, when you look at those incidents where the Prophet وسلم, um, you know, seemed to order the assassination of someone who, uh, who showed him enmity or showed him insult, uh, it's, there's always something else to it. And that's the idea here, right? So when we talk about Ka'ab and uh, Ashraf, we talk about a man who not only insulted the Messenger وسلم, but also was a warmonger, also someone that brought much harm to the Messenger uh, And we do plan, inshallah, to actually address those incidents in quite some detail. Uh, but, you know, the, the point is, is that there are different levels of insults. Clearly, the Messenger وسلم, dealt with things uh, with grace. And justice is to be shown in some of these situations. But the Messenger وسلم, consistently opted for mercy. Um, so uh, there's a question here how do you explain the situation of Banu Quraida? Now, when we talk about Banu Quraida, um, first of all, there, there are a few things about Banu Quraida. Number one, uh, it's, not, it's not fair to make that the normal uh, interaction or the basis for how the Prophet وسلم, normally interacted with the Jews of Medina. Uh, there were several tribes of uh, of Jews in Medina and the Messenger وسلم, had a good relationship with them. Uh, Banu Quraida is an incident uh, or is a situation when you have uh, three tribes actually, Banu Quraida, Banu Nadir, and Banu Qaynuqa, but particularly in the case of uh, Khandaq, uh, Banu uh, Quraida, who are accused of treason, right, for plotting with uh, the enemies of the Prophet وسلم, and the enemies of the state. Right to uh, to have the messengers and the Muslims massacred. So you have an outside enemy attacking Medina, 
and you have a group of people that conspire with those that are coming from the outside, uh, you know, to, to, to harm the Muslims, uh, you know, inside the state. So this was a violation, not just from a, from a religious perspective, it was also a violation of the constitution and the pact that the Messenger Salaam had with all of the non-Muslim tribes in Medina, including the Jewish tribes. Not all the Jewish tribes violated that constitution or that pact, but in this situation you had a clear violation. Now, uh, let's say that, you know, a person wants to argue that no, they did not violate anything, and a person wants to to to, to use uh, Banu Quraida uh, to say that the Prophet Sallallahu had it out for the Jews. Well, how do you explain the normal situation, the, you know, the, the normal ties that the Messenger Sallallahu had with uh, so many other Jews? So whether or not you, you argue this from a Muslim perspective or a non-Muslim perspective, you cannot make this the basis for how the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi dealt with, uh, dealt with uh, Jews. Now, with that being said, um, Banu Quraiba were dealt with from an Islamic perspective. Their punishment was directly uh, taken from the Torah. So the, the judgment was actually passed against them in accordance with uh, the laws of the Torah. And this, is, this was something that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi ordained, uh, legal pluralism, that when non-Muslims lived under Muslims, uh, particularly the people of the book, they were to be judged by their own scholars and they were to be judged by their own texts All right, when it came to religious things. So uh, the crime of treason um, was applied. Uh, with that being said, another discussion that's important to have is the amount of people uh, that were uh, killed. Uh, the 600, 700, um, you know, uh, number that comes up with, with those that were killed in Banu Quraida uh, is not the most authentic portrayal. So it's somewhere probably around 150 to 200 people. Some may even say even less based on the sources uh, of the men that were killed uh, in Banu Quraida. So uh, that's actually something which we have a future research paper. Again, Sheikh Mohammed al-Shanawi and myself are working on a paper on uh, the relationship with the Prophet Sallallahu and the Jews of Medina. Um, and that'll sort of, just like we did with this paper, we always want to start off, before we analyze exceptions, we always want to start off with putting out the norm, that this is how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi normally uh, dealt with people, uh, to show, you know, that, that Muslims and Jews did indeed, as, as in many parts of history, enjoyed good relationships, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi enjoyed a good relationship with many of the Jews. So it would be anti-Semitic on one hand, or anti, you know, it'd be anti-Jewish and, and, and bigoted to say that the Jews were inherently treacherous, and that's why Ben Qurayda, the incident of Ben Qurayda happened. And it would also be, you know, Islamophobic rhetoric or, or uh, uh, improper to say that the Muslims inherently had it out for the Jews, and that the Prophet ﷺ was always after the Jews. So both of these are extreme arguments. So you have to analyze these incidents first and foremost by setting a premise, which is what we did uh, with this paper, inshallah. So look out for that publication, inshallah, coming soon. All right. I think the broadcast is fine on my end, so I don't see that it keeps on getting interrupted from my end. Abu Abad. Some people disregard the colonial project argument um, as mere conspiracy theory. What is an effective response to that sense of resistance uh, to the notion of propaganda for imperial uh, gains? Some people disregard the colonial project argument as mere conspiracy theory. What is an effective response to that sense of resistance to the notion of propaganda for imperial gains? Uh, I think that it's undeniable. The colonial project is undeniable. This is not just something that uh, the British employed when they conquered the Muslim territories. It's something that the British employed uh, against any uh, disadvantaged people or any people that were being conquered or oppressed. There was, you know, there is nothing that is that, that forms a more stable sense of resistance uh, than a cultural resistance, and that cultural resistance is often deeply embedded within a religious tradition. And so, resistance to imperialism and to colonialism often came through uh, through an Islamic uh, form of resisting colonialism and occupation imperialism, especially when we're talking even early in the 20th century. Um, on the other hand, you know, there, there was uh, much to gain to implant certain ideas internally within these Muslim countries and within these Muslim communities of a form of Islam that uh, would be more friendly to colonialism. So as, as some history scholars would point out, historians would point out that two games were played basically within the imperial uh, 
uh, project or uh, for imperial gains. Internally, it's to portray, it, it's to, to formulate uh, a form of religion or cultural identity that does not resist occupation or imperialism or colonialism. Externally, the justification for imperialism and for colonialism is to portray the conquered as being barbaric, inherently barbaric and a threat to the world. And therefore they cannot but be contained and dealt with in an inhumane fashion because they are not actually human, right? They're not, they're not like decent civilized human beings. So it can be dismissed as conspiracy theory, but I think that there is, there's much to that. There's much to gain by portraying uh, the Muslims in such a fashion and by, by portraying Islam as inherently violent. And the only way that part of the world can be dealt with is not diplomacy, but by carpet bombings and, and uh, occupation. Uh, so I think that there's, it's hard to argue against that, um, you know, but we're, you know, with everything going on right now politically, it's, it's hard to, um, it's hard to distinguish truth from falsehood a lot on these things. So, uh, all right. But, but the, the idea here, the colonial project is put forth by non-Muslim academics as well as Muslim academics. Okay. So it's not just, it's not just Facebook, but actually non-Muslim academics putting out this time. All right. Okay. Um, this question is not related to the resource or to the research. So I'm, uh, we live in a time where Muslims are constantly demonized in the U.S. However, I sincerely wonder if Muslims would be as concerned. If it was some other group that was demonized, President Obama and many others before him had been deporting Mexicans for decades and Muslims have never mentioned these tragedies in their lectures, khutbas, etc. Similar for blacks, what right do we have to criticize others who attack us when we will not stand up for them? Um, if I'm not mistaken, the Prophet Sallallahu did not did charity and other humanitarian work for pagans for 40 years before preaching during his prophethood. If Muslims want to respect, want the respect and defense from others, shouldn't we have to earn it as well? There are two questions there. They're not really related to the research, so I'll just give you quick answers. Number one, um, many of the people that are criticizing uh, Donald Trump's administration were also criticizing Obama's administration. I'm one of them. I think that the blatant nature of this and the danger of this time uh, forces us to organize in a certain way and forces us to uh, to come out in a certain way. But I agree with you. Just and I'm and I'm I'm not trying to dismiss your question, which is why I read it and I'm answering it quickly. I agree with you that it's important for us to be there for other. Uh, communities, inshallah ta'ala, not just so they can be there for us, but because that's who we are. So it's not just that we should earn their support by being there for them, it's just who we are. All right. Um, mashallah, all right, Somalia. What's an effective response to accusations about apostasy law in Islam? So that's one of also some research uh, that we're doing right now, inshallah ta'ala, as to formulating a proper um, uh, or a comprehensive, thorough response with Dr. Hatim and Hajj and Dr. Jonathan Brown as well, inshallah ta'ala, um, on the question of apostasy. I think that uh, the, the, the paper that we put out with uh, Sister Tasneem al qiq which she will be doing a Q&A about religious minorities, inshallah, uh, answered some of those questions. One of those, um, one answer which is very important is that the whole concept of citizenship, which she mentions in her paper, um, thoroughly, and this is again according to non-Muslim academics, the whole concept of citizenship um, in the past was not in accordance with the nation state, but it was more so with your religious identity than anything else. So when apostasy was equivalent to a form of treason, which in many ways it, it was at the time, then it was dealt with in a certain way. Um, when apostasy is, is uh, uh, and, and this is something that Dr. Hatim argues that apostasy is, or the crime for, the punishment for apostasy is not a had, it's actually in the ta'adid, it's actually something that's uh, in, in the judgment of the court, so the implications of that apostasy. Um, but I think that there, there is debate um, about what it means, and we should, not, we should not come up with a response just to appease, but we should actually, and this is our goal at Yaqeen, is to actually uh, study these issues for what they are, um, and to provide comprehensive understandings of both classical positions and present day implementations. So what that meant classically, um, and I do believe this and I say this all the time, 
that Islam has always, has always, if you look at the time periods that it was in, Islam, when it came to the ethics of war, when it came to humanitarianism, when it came to showing mercy to captives, to uh, foes, to, uh, you know, to, to different nation states, um, Islam has always been at the forefront of setting a moral standard for the world. And that's true in the seventh century, and it should be true today as well. So the effective response, first and foremost, just is, is one that we, we need to formulate comprehensively. We can't just gloss over these issues or give uh, one or two sentence answers. Um, but, you know, it's important to point out what citizenship truly entailed. Uh, the, the, the punishment for treason in the United States um, is, is a capital punishment, right? So at w what points did apostasy in, you know, in, 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 class, in, in the classical era actually um, you know, uh, equal to uh, a form of treason. So that's something to be discovered, inshallah ta'ala, to look, be looked into. And again, uh, we have both Dr. Hatim, inshallah ta'ala, uh, as well as Dr. Brown uh, working on something in that regard, inshallah. If the Muslim state is being threatened by people trying to secede, is it Islamically just to suppress that revolt, even if it causes killing and suppression? That's a highly theoretical question. So Azam is asking, if the Muslim state is being threatened by people trying to secede, is it Islamically just to suppress that revolt even if it causes uh, killing and suppression? Um, that depends highly on the situation. Um, I think that you know when we talk about what a Muslim state is um, and what a threat actually entails, uh, you know, and, and uh, you know what that secession entails. So, is it a nation state where you have uh, another nation state that's trying to form? Because surely that's not the equivalent of uh, khilafa existing, uh, you know, a righteous khilafa and and, and, a, and someone trying to secede out of a righteous khilafa. Um, and you know, what are what what is the definition there of that uh, of that secession? So, generally speaking. Um, you know, when, when we talk about Islam and Islamic ethics and politics, so I'll give I'll give an answer which I hope inshallah ta'ala just in, in light of the fact that I you know these are these details are very important. Uh, they're highly theoretical. Um, <clears throat> when we talk about the Muslims and we talk about uh, what our political ethics entail, is Islam pro stability and at what expense is Islam pro stability? So looking throughout our Qur'an and Sunnah, uh, Islam does not believe, or, or the Prophet Sallallahu was, was sure to put out this idea that the people are responsible to the ruler and the ruler is accountable to the people. So they're both accountable to each other. There's, there are different parties. There are inherent checks and balances that exist within um, the political ethics of Islam. So, you know, what constitutes... Um, you know, disobedience or re revolution and what constitutes uh, a, a, a permissible way or a praiseworthy way, kalima to haqq the sultan and ja'ad, as the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, the greatest form of jihad is to speak a word of truth to an unjust ruler. Uh, what is uh, loyal opposition and what is detrimental to the people and to the state? So all of those things are considered um, and this is the... Uh, the importance of shura. Realize that I tell people this all the time that when you know even the Sahaba themselves had to take shura to formulate responses to unique situations. So Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Umar, if there was to be a prophet after me, it would have been Umar. When he was faced with these unique situations, he would often take Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Salman and and Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas and these great companions into, into confidence and ask them. And he would often find disagreement amongst them as to how to deal with the situation. An example of that is when uh, Hurmuzan, the ruler of Persia, was brought to the Muslim territories. This is not to venture too far off, but it actually relates to our research. And um, he was, uh, you know, he was going to be executed. He was, you know, he was at war with the Muslims. He was going to be executed. And uh, he said to, he asked Umar radiAllahu Taala Anhu for a glass of water, and uh, when Umar gave him the glass of water, he said, "Do you promise me that I'm safe until I finish this glass of water?" Okay, I'm gonna take a sip of this. 
right, I'm that's coffee, not water. But he said, do you promise me that I'm safe until I finish uh, this glass of water? So um, Umar radiallahu anhu told him yes. So when Umar told him that, he broke the glass of water. And Umar was stuck. He didn't know what to do. So Umar radiallahu anhu consulted the companions, Ali and Ibn Auf and others. Do I have to fulfill this promise to him or not? I mean, he clearly just, just pulled one on me. Um, and they differed. Some of them said you have to honor the oath. Some of them said you, you don't. And Umar radiallahu anhu opted to honor uh, that promise. And uh, when he did that, uh, Hurmuzan was told basically he's, he's, he's free to go because uh, he was given a promise of safety until he finishes drinking that glass of water, which he never did. And when he did that, Hurmuzan uh, said, Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah, Ashhadu Allah Muhammad Rasulullah. So he actually took shahada. So this is one of the narrations that comes down to us. And the point to illustrate here is that um, is that you're going to have different responses to different issues, even from the companions as they were dealing with situations. How did we? How did they deal with the fitna? Right? There were different responses. Can we really say that? Um, you know, Abdullah ibn Umar and Abdullah ibn Zubair, may Allah be pleased with them both. Um, that either one of them was wrong in their approach, right? Abdullah ibn Umar deciding silence, Abdullah ibn, uh, Abdullah ibn Zubair radiallahu uh, ta'ala anhu uh, taking a much more dramatic approach, um, you know, becoming uh, essentially a khalifa uh, of the Haramain. And there were two khilafas essentially that existed when, with Ibn Zubair radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. Uh, rahimallah for some time. There were actually two s subsequent khilafas. So all of these are highly hypothetical um, and uh, they require uh, sound advice from the scholarly bodies of the time. All right. Awesome. How do we implement the kind of mercy that the Prophet ﷺ showed in our lives at our level? How do we? So, so Hisham asks, how do we implement this kind of mercy that the Prophet's uh, that the Prophet ﷺ showed in our own lives. Well, surely, if the Prophet ﷺ dealt with his enemies in such a way, then we can deal with those that harm us um, or those that insult us with the same grace that the Messenger ﷺ dealt with. Uh, you know, I, I'm thinking, I believe it was Dr. Ad al Qarni who mentioned that if we were to deal with our loved ones the way the Prophet ﷺ dealt with his enemies, then we would be well. <laughs> we'd be well off as an ummah. So if we showed the same level of grace to our loved ones that the Prophet ﷺ showed with his enemies, then we would do well. But we are harsher on our uh, loved ones than the Prophet ﷺ was on his enemies, on his worst enemies. So I think we, we try to implement that same level of grace. Uh, one of the poems about the Prophet ﷺ that was said in Amil Wufud in the year of the delegation, um, uh, I, the, the name of the companion escapes me. Um, maybe someone can, can give it to me. Um, I, I know he's Al-Ja'di. But anyway, he, he said about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, لا خير في حلم إذا لم يكن له بوادر تحمي صفوهو أن يكدره. He said that, that there is no good in, in, a forbe in, in, in showing forbearance or compassion that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam showed if you don't have the proper, uh, you know, protocols so that your compassion and your forbearance is not one that puts, that puts your community at danger, right? So you have to also have the strategy with your compassion and the strategy with your love, especially when you're talking about a person that's in a position of authority. You know, at what, you know when are you putting your community in harm's way or when are you putting yourself in harm's way? There's a, there's a fine line between being gracious and, and being naive. So he praised the Prophet Wasallam's helm, his forbearance, um, you know, for, that, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had certain, you know, he, 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 he knew when to get angry, he knew when to show forbearance, and though he was loving and graceful Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he didn't put his community in harm's way due to his grace and due to his mercy. Uh, on the other hand, when you talk about, um, when you talk about jahl, he says, وَلَا خَيْرَ فِي جَهْلٍ And there's no good in anger. And, and actually, interestingly enough, jahl in Arabic poetry was the word used to describe anger. Jahl means ignorance, but in, but in Arabic poetry, jahl actually refers to anger. Um, you know, where the Prophet, where, where, where he describes the Prophet's life. So that, you know, there's no good in anger if a person doesn't know when to stop. 
He doesn't know when to put it to a stop. So you have to show anger in measured proportions at time for the sake of justice. But if your anger is nafsi or it's for ego, then you're going to go too far and you're going to you're going to transgress. So a person has to know when to check their anger as well, and that's the description of the Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. All right, this is a really good question. Um, K.L. Uh, Whiteman, I'm, I'm a revert. May Allah bless you and keep you firm. I find that there are a lot of Muslims that when they are yelled at in the street, they deal with the situation in the same manner, yelling back. When I asked about this, I was told as Muslims, we cannot let people get away with insults that we should fight back. <sighs> Loaded question. Um, and um, I believe that there is a balance to be struck here. And we see it with the Messenger وسلم, as well. That sometimes the Prophet وسلم, responded to insult in like manner, not becoming foul, not becoming filthy, but essentially showing a, a stance of dignity and, and, and a refusal to be bullied. The problem in a climate where it is normalized to insult Muslims or to uh, discriminate against Muslims, the problem with letting that go is that you enable that person to do it again. Now we have to choose our battles and we have to choose when we decide to smile and let it go and when we decide to actually you know pursue press charges in some cases right report things uh in order to, to 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 really protect other people that could be in that person's harm's way if you have someone that's being a jerk or that's being a little rude to you you know then it's best to to, to just be the bigger person and to smile and to, and to let it go if you have someone that's threatening you or that's putting you in a compromising situation uh, then it's better, especially in a climate like this, uh, to show a stance of dignity and strength, not to become foul, not to do anything un-Islamic, but to show a position of dignity and strength, so that those Islamophobes are not further enabled to, to, to carry out that discrimination, not just against Muslims, but against anybody. Uh, and, and consider your environment, right? You know, how vulnerable are you in that situation? Uh, so consider your vulnerability, consider your environment, and consider the effectiveness of your response. So I don't think that there's an absolute um, that that there's an absolute way to deal with this. I, I do believe it's a judgment call every time, uh, and and I think first and foremost your safety and your vulnerability should be considered. So if someone yells at you and you're alone and you're in, you're in a compromising situation, you yell back and that could get you hurt. Then obviously you need to you need to consider that. Um, but if, if it's a situation where, you know, you feel safe, you feel protected, you know, there was a sister, for example, that um, pulled out her cell phone and was recording a man berating her in a cafe, um, and that meant something, right, and showing some dignity, some strength. Or it, it, it's dignity and strength to respond with grace as well, but what I mean by strength here, I mean, basically, you know, we're not going to be bullied by you. She didn't curse. She didn't use the same foul language that he used. But it was the language that, uh, that bullies need to hear sometimes, which is that we are not intimidated by you. So sometimes it's important to respond to intimidation with, uh, with, with strength in that you, you basically show that you will not be bullied and you will not be threatened or intimidated. But again, you have, you have a jerk, you have someone that's dealing with you. Um, you know, in a certain way that's not showing you the best of manners. And don't let people with bad character teach you bad character. You teach them good character. That's it, fa'abillati yahsan. Respond to that which is evil with that which is better. So respond with grace, inshallah ta'ala, and that's better for you in that situation. Um, all right. Am I planning to come to Turkey soon? Inshallah, I hope so. Should I go to Hajj this year if I'm a green card holder? Yes, inshallah, but check with your care chapter or legal uh, advice um, first. Um, all right, a lot of these questions are not in any way related. Okay. Uh, no offense, guys, but I just want to keep the I, I want to keep the Q and A focused, inshallah. All right, and you're constantly insulted by enemies or even family. Where do you get your sense of self worth from?
Uh, you know, look, you're, you're, you know, you have to, as much as you can, be able to bear, uh, you know, people being rude with you. There, there are different levels of insult and different levels of enmity that are shown. Harm should not be, should not be accepted. So you should not accept harm for yourself. You should never enable an abuser. But where do you get your self-worth from? Your sense of self-worth has to come from a deep internal place, uh, deep in the heart where you recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who created you and Allah is the one who assigns value to you. So your value as a person should come from your, your sense of belief and, and, and how you cling to that covenant with God. Um, I think that's an important, um, you know, that's an important uh, consideration um, and there are different levels of insult. So, but again, your sense of self-worth should come first and foremost uh, from from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. All right. So, I just got a message. Zakhallah khair. CLCMA is not recommending green card card holders to go for Hajj. Okay, fine. I take that back. All right. So, speak to uh, speak to an attorney and and make that decision, inshallah. May, but may Allah reward you for your intention, regardless. All right. Last one. How to control emotions if someone uses foul language about our Prophet and Islam. It is very hard to control our emotions. Please advise. That's a good question to end with. All right. When the Prophet is insulted or people use foul language about Islam and the Messenger, they are trying to put they are trying to put you in a place where you will prove their point about about you and as Muslims being barbaric. Uh, when the Prophet ﷺ was insulted in Mecca, the goal was to make the Prophet ﷺ respond in like manner and to bring the Muslims to a point where they were just as foul and filthy as those who were oppressing them. And the Prophet ﷺ didn't fall for it and that frustrated the people of Mecca. So when they, they called the Prophet ﷺ Mudhannam, which means the one who's humiliated, the Messenger ﷺ, you know, he, that's his name. That's his name. He's being called... Uh, Mudhammam instead of Muhammad. Muhammad is highly praised, Mudhammam is humiliated. And the Sahaba were infuriated. And the Prophet ﷺ, uh, told them, don't you see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is diverting their insults away from me? It's taking their insults away from me. They're insulting Mudhammam and my name is Muhammad wasallam. So the Messenger ﷺ is teaching them not to, not to let those people bring you to their level. So when they draw these cartoons, that's not our Prophet ﷺ. That image of this angry, ugly man with a bomb on his head, that's not our Prophet ﷺ. They can write the name Muhammad on it. That's not our Prophet ﷺ. Um, we should not let ourselves be pulled into these things so that we can continue to be portrayed in a way that we deserve oppression as an excuse for those that, tan that, that actually will oppress Muslims in a tangible way. So we respond with dignity, inshallah. We respond with uh, with showing who our Prophet ﷺ actually was and who he is, alayhi salatu wasalam, to us. Um, and we always have to consider what's actually good for Islam and for the, the message of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So jazakumullah khair, guys. I'm going to go ahead and end here. Uh, I appreciate you guys tuning in. Uh, make sure you read the research. Make sure you read the paper that we released on, uh, on religious minorities. It's a fantastic uh, paper. Uh, by Tasneem al Qiq uh, and continue to support Yaqeen, inshallah. It's our two week fundraising drive, so please do pitch in in whatever way you can, inshallah, to keep us going, to keep us providing free research, inshallah ta'ala, and free. All right, sorry, my connection froze. Free research and free media, inshallah, for the benefit of uh, everyone around. Jazakumullah khairan. Subhanakallah. Alhamdulillah. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.